away from people's freedoms and liberties. And in Plumas County and other counties similar to ours here, some of these changes have had a negative impact on our economy, on our business, on our industry, in Plumas County, historically, we had a very strong timber industry and a strong mining industry, and it brought a tremendous measure of wealth to, to our citizens. And some of the federal agencies that oversee the lands have enacted rules and regulations that don't permit uh, those, those industries to be successful the way they had been in the past. Our schools are getting smaller, our population is shrinking, and it's keeping people from enjoying um, the economic success that we've had in the past, and now it's infringing on private property owners' ability to farm um, and to develop their properties. So myself and a number of other sheriffs across the country have taken a strong position to protect the citizens who elected us and who look to us to not only keep them safe from crime and criminals, 
but they also now look to us to protect their liberties and ensure their freedoms. And when I saw those freedoms and liberties being challenged or diminished, I spoke out, uh, I think pretty clearly, that uh, we, we need to not let that happen. And people should be free to, to travel in the forests. People should be, uh, you know, encouraged to, to be successful in, in the timber industry and in mining. And all of those industries have, have suffered to the point that our, that our economy has shrunk and we're not as successful as we used to be. Now, I know one of the questions is a lot of people think that we are focusing on the Second, second Amendment, the, the, the right of the people to, to keep and bear arms, firearms. That is, that's one issue in a, in a, amongst many, many other issues, but it's an important issue. There have been a number of tragedies, not just in the United States, but all over the world, but in the United States we've had some, some, some horrible acts of violence the Sandy Hook incident where the children at the school were shot. Uh, in Aurora, Colorado, the movie theater shooting. Um, down in uh, the southwest, one of our, one of our Congress ladies was shot. There, there is a lot of violence in this world. Taking, taking away the liberties and freedoms is they relate to firearms and the right to keep and bear arms and self-defense. Taking taking those freedoms from the law-abiding citizen will not stop the, the mentally disturbed or or the criminally inclined from carrying out those acts of violence. Gun violence is a big problem in the United States. In Chicago, Illinois, they'll shoot 50, 60 people a week. It's a big problem. But taking the, the rights away from honest, hardworking, law-abiding citizens will not address the behavior of those individuals who are emotionally disturbed or criminally inclined. And I think my opinion is that until we change people's attitudes and behaviors, we're going to continue to have this problem no matter how many restrictions you put on law-abiding gun owners. The law-abiding citizen who will be deprived of their rights or their abilities uh, to own, possess, and, and enjoy sporting firearms or, or weapons for self-defense and home protection. Uh, when, when, you, when you take those liberties away from those people, you're not addressing the underlying problem that, that brings the violence to, to, these, to, the, to the victims. By simply making an object illegal, you're not addressing the, the behavior and the, the attitudes and the illness that, that precipitate the violence. So I really don't see the gun control efforts that are currently being explored as, as a path to successfully stopping the violence in this country or anywhere else. You have to look at behaviors and the mental illness 
and some of the root causes of these behaviors. It's not the object. It's the person and the illness or, or the dysfunction that they suffer from that causes this. And making something illegal doesn't stop it from happening. It's been illegal to murder people for a long time. And people still do it. It's against the law to break into people's homes. But people still do it. It's against the law to drive drunk. But people still do it. So making something illegal does not cure the problem. And when you enact legislation and laws and regulations that affect an individual, an individual's Second Amendment right, you're not doing, you're really not doing justice to the problem. You're, you're not going to change the, where where this problem originates, and that's in behaviors, attitudes, and illness. And. <coughs> You don't have to look too far back in history where the rights of citizens to own and possess firearms, when that's taken away, it leaves the door open to other abuses um, that, that, that we've, we've, we've seen the results of that um, in Europe. Um, and, and that has been one of the first steps that, that, that governments take. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that our government is trying to take people's firearms away as part of some larger plan to do something else. I'm not suggesting that, and I don't believe that. Um, but there can be unintended consequences when when you when you start changing some of the fundamentals that that this country was built on and uh, the second amendment is very very important like i said it's the second amendment for a reason it's just b below the freedom of speech freedom of religion it's that important. They didn't make it the ninth or tenth. <laughs> they made it. The, they made it the second one because it's a very, very f important principle upon which this country was founded, and it's it's a it's a freedom and liberty that I think needs to be safeguarded. And when you when you consider the direction that that's that our government occasionally is headed down, where <clears throat> instead of expanding, granting greater freedoms, granting greater liberties, they're shrinking our freedoms and they're shrinking our liberties. And if that continues, where, where are we going to be left, you know, in 20, 30, 50 years? We're very regulated from the kind of fuels we can put in our car to the kind of foods that we can eat and the, you name it, there's, there's a regulation from the government that, that impacts so many aspects of our lives. I would like to see government be smaller and our freedoms larger. And a lot of sheriffs throughout the country, throughout the United States and throughout the state of California um, feel the same way and so there are some organizations that have come together uh, of sheriffs and, and officials to, to stand up for um, the, the founding principles, the, the cornerstones that this country was built on. It was an interesting experiment back in the late 1700s. But those documents, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, um, have, they're, they're a living document and they're as relevant today as they were when they were written. And, and 
tampering with that or fundamentally changing that, I think is a frightening proposition. And other sheriffs and law enforcement officials and, and other government officials that, that share that idea with me are, are coming together in organized groups. Um, and I think people have been very supportive of us. Generally, people look at the sheriff or the police as people who enforce the law and arrest people who do wrong things. But now, there's, there's a greater emphasis on our responsibility to protect people's freedoms, protect their liberties, and that is a responsibility that, that we all take very, very seriously. Where and when started the idea of getting together? I've been the sheriff for four years, and this idea of organizing officials who feel the same way uh, started a little bit before I took office, and the number of sheriffs and, and law enforcement officials uh, who are, are coming together to support one another is growing all the time. Um, but it started, you know, it really started, uh, you know, a handful of years ago. Um, here in, in, in our area, uh, it started with the the closure of roads in the forests and, and new rules that keep people out of the woods um, and restrict their ability to, to, to cut timber or, or to engage in mining. Um, like I said earlier, those have been um, kind of the, the foundations of our economy and have brought a lot of prosperity and wealth to our to our to our communities, and now that those are being restricted, um, our our communities are suffering. So it, it started. This this effort has kind of it started several years ago, but it's it's growing as as the government continues to try to to uh, bring more regulation and restrictions to uh, some of our our uh, our our basic you know, ways of life. Agriculture, farming, timber, mining, um, those are all being heavily regulated and restricted by the government. And my, my fear is that if this continues at the pace that it's happening, within 20 or 30 years, we won't be able to do anything here and you're going to see these small towns go away and our quality of life uh, will suffer and it will cause people to leave, leave these communities and be forced to live in larger metropolitan areas. And as you've seen, as you've traveled, it's very pretty here, it's very beautiful, it's a very nice, it's a very nice life that we have here. Um, it's relatively safe, and we want to continue to, to, to live the way that we live here and enjoy the resources that we've enjoyed in the past to, to, to build our, our success. What was your personally triggering event to join the Constitutional Service? For me, the, the event, the action that, that caused me to become active in this was uh, the force, the United States Forest Service, which is a federal agency, part of the Department of Agriculture. They began 
restrictions on the public's access to public lands. For us locally, the forests, closing roads and restricting the public's access to public lands. These are public lands and the public should be encouraged to enjoy them and to use them and, and in doing so develop a real appreciation for them. But when you restrict people's ability to enjoy, you know, the public lands that, that really are the people's, then I think we have a, a real problem and that's what caused me to become active in this. Do the constitutional sheriffs view the Constitution as the, the high watermark of legislation? We do. I do. It is... I spoke about it earlier. It's an incredible piece of work. The United States Constitution is, is a living document that is as relevant today, if not more relevant today, than it was when it was when it was first created. Um, and I do look at that as a legislative high, high watermark. I really do. And there are people, there are, there are those who believe that certain parts of it aren't relevant today or certain parts of it should be changed. I think we can discuss and debate, but when you change the, the, the foundation, the foundational underpinning, the, the piece of work that really distinguished this country from, from much of the world, that that isn't something that can be done lightly. And it can't, it should not be done to simply, a, a, appease or address one group of people's issues today. This is a document that's, you know, a couple of hundred years old, and it served us exceptionally well, and it enumerates very specifically the very rights, freedoms, and liberties that, that have allowed us to be so successful in such a short period of time. And so I do, I do look at the Constitution as a legislative high watermark, I really do. They haven't come up with anything better since, and I don't think they're going to come up with anything better in the future. So it's, 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 very, it's a very special, a very important piece of, of work that uh, has served this country very, very well for many generations, and we should not go about changing that. Uh, to simply appease a perceived problem today, if, if we if we adhere to the to the principles to the to the founding fathers, uh, subscribe theories, and and, the, and we stick to those freedoms and liberties, I, I think we can remain you know a, a good, strong, prosperous country, and and changing that. Uh, it's just not something we should be, should we, we shouldn't do that without some real careful consideration. The question is, <clears throat> is the citizen a citizen of the county or state first, or is he a citizen of the United States first? And First and foremost, everyone is an American or a United States citizen. You can be from California or you can be a Californian, but first and foremost, you're American. And what is unique about America 
and I said this in a speech a year or two ago. If I go to Japan, I'll never be Japanese. If I go to India, I'll never be an Indian. If I go to Africa, I won't be an African. But people from Japan, India, and Africa can come to the United States and they can be an American. And that is unique, it's very unique in this world, and it's very special. So first and foremost, everybody here, you're an American. You can be a Californian after that, because you may be a Californian this year, and you could be a New Yorker the next year. You might be a Texan the year after that, but you're always going to be an American. And that is the most important. To the, to the legal and responsible process of, of, of doing that. You become invested in your country. You, you develop a commitment to your country that I fear people that do it illegally don't have that same commitment or that same investment and they don't look at it as their country. If you come here and you want to become a, a U.S. citizen, you can do that. And when you go through that process to, to establish that identity, you're committed to your country, you're invested in your in your country and you're, and, you're, and you're dedicated to your country. And people who come here illegally I don't think have that same commitment, investment, or dedication to the country. Um, it's like I said, any, any people from Japan can come here and be an American. People from any, any nation, any country, anywhere in the world, they can come to the United States and they can become an American. But you can't, I could never go to all of those different places and become you know, Japanese, Indian, African, I, that doesn't work that way. So it's a very unique, it's a very unique set of circumstances and, and when, you, when you go through the process and you make that dedication and commitment, um, I think, I think it, it gives you pride and, and dedication to your citizenship. The constitutional sheriffs, the question is, being a constitutional sheriff, does it, how does it affect our relationship with the federal government and the federal agencies and some of the state agencies? I've spoken pretty clearly on my, uh, on my position when it comes to what some of the federal agencies are doing. I work with the, these federal agencies here locally in my community in this and in this county. I don't agree with what some of these agencies are doing, and that's why I've spoken against it. But the people who are here 
that work for those agencies are very, very nice people. The decision making that's going on in Washington, D.C., in some of the larger offices, um, that is what I take exception to. Working with the local representatives of those agencies, I get along with them very well and I've known most of them a good portion of my life. I harbor no ill will towards them and they're, and they're, and they're wonderful members of our communities. Um, I simply don't agree with what their agencies are regulating and doing um, on the national level that, if, that, that comes down to affecting our community. I like the people that are here. I don't agree with what they're doing back in Washington. Did this, did this change the way that my, my daily work is with these people in these agencies? In some ways, it's, it's caused us to work more closely because there's, there, we've, we've, we've gotten to a point where everyone recognizes that we have a problem. And locally, a lot of, a lot of the representatives from, say, the Forest Service, um, have been very nice to work with, and they recognize that there are, there are problems. So we actually work together more often. We meet more regularly. Um, we don't always agree, but it's actually caused us to, to work more, more often and meet more often than we had in the past. Some people are concerned about the constitutional, the idea of the constitutional sheriff. Um, there are people who are openly critical of the idea of a constant, you know, of, of sheriffs who are looked upon as constitutional sheriffs. The idea of being a constitutional sheriff is is really simply subscribing to what is in our Constitution, subscribing to the oath of office that we take. This is new. A lot of sheriffs haven't done this in the past, so I think whenever, whenever something new develops, there, there may be some concern. There are those people who have a different political outlook that um, criticize or insult or marginalize our relevance or our significance. But every Every elected official should be a constitutional, either sheriff or tax collector or district attorney or judge. You know, it's it's our constitution, it's our it's our it's our republic, and and it's our form of government that that allows us to enjoy, you know, and be blessed with the positions that we hold, and we need to we need to really be aware of that. And we need to subscribe very sincerely to the, the foundational principles, the underpinnings that, that, that allowed this country to be so successful and, 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 what give up, and what gives us our freedoms and our liberties. And the fact that people oppose and are outspoken is a liberty and a freedom that they enjoy based on the very document that we're trying to defend, which is kind of interesting. Um, our, 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 some of our harshest critics would uh, do well to appreciate the fact that the very freedoms 
and liberties that, that allow them to voice their, their opposition are based in the document and the principles that we're trying to defend. So it's, it's interesting. I think the question kind of relates to our sense of community and our cohesiveness and a sense of family. And, in, and as it relates to Plumas County, Plumas County, California, I think the smaller the community, the closer the people are and the more important family becomes. We're very, very, we are a series of small communities in, in this county. We're about 20,000 people in a very good sized county. We're almost 3,000 square miles, but we only have 20,000 people and we have small communities and family is very important. And we, as times become more challenging, we are blessed with our communities coming together closer, more cohesive, um, working together, and family is family is a very very important part of that. I know my family. I live just down the street from my parents, who still live in the house I grew up in. I live at the end of the street, and. Family is very, very important, and community is very, very important. And that closeness is is unique to small communities, and that's one of our, our good fortunes here. Established, have we seen a decline in crime? No. No, we, we haven't seen a decline in crime, but what we've what I've seen is an increase in the public's support of, of, of myself and my office and my staff and my officers as we, as we subscribe to, to sound fundamental principle public service, the community is responding by by supporting us more. There are still people that do things they shouldn't do in our communities. And I'm hoping that as the communities strengthen and as people become aware of the problems and we work together more closely and we're more supportive of our communities and our, our community is more supportive of us, I'm hoping that we'll see crime go down. But right now, it's, it's about the same. Um, I can imagine and I'm pleased to know that people in Germany and actually people, I've heard from people in England and New Zealand and, and as well as Germany. <coughs> that people share the same concerns uh, that, that I do and, 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 the, and that, the, that the sheriffs in California throughout the country have. The world's a smaller place today. We communicate politically, it's becoming, the lines are becoming more blurred and I think the basic issues of liberties and freedoms and prosperity and success, those issues that are so close to my heart, I know are close to your heart in Germany as well. So we share the same concerns because these are, these are some of the f real basics of, of, of our lives in terms of freedoms, liberties, the ability to be successful and, and pursue the happiness in your life 
and, and be safe and secure in where you live. Those are concerns and interests that, that we share no matter what country you live in. Um, and as we see our countries kind of doing some similar things uh, in terms of regulations and restrictions, um, it doesn't surprise me that people in Germany, for example, are just as concerned about it as as we are here in the United States, and because we can communicate so much more effectively now than we could even 20, 30 years ago, I I think it's this is a situation where technology is 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 allowing us to share ideas and offer support um, to one another much more effectively than we've ever been able to do in the past. So I'm, I'm glad to know that there are people, uh, that, that a lot of people in Germany are looking at some of these issues uh, with the same degree of concern that we are, because we're looking at a lot of the same issues, a lot of the same problems. Can we peacefully trans make the changes that need to be made from community to community and from maybe the local level to the state level or the local level to the federal level? Can we make these changes peacefully? I think you you can make these changes peacefully and effectively when there is respect between everybody involved and there's balance and there's a measure a recognition of, of equality and though we may be a small community our our ideas our ideals our principles should not be looked upon with any less significance because we're small than, than than larger communities and whether it's this country or another country. You you can do you can do we can come to the to the answers and the solutions that we need when there is equal respect and a balance of authority um, when when one side is looked upon as weaker or less valuable, the other side we've seen we've seen through the ages there that opens the door to a lot of abuses and to to keep things on on balance. Everybody has to be respected and and, and uh, there should there should be no fear and there should be no violence but things need to be fair and equal and there needs to be a measure of respect regardless of how if you're a federal agency dealing with a local small town they need to have the respect uh, that, that we deserve. There needs to be respect and, uh, and balance there so that there aren't abuses. You don't have one ganging up on, you don't have the big guy beating up on the little guy. The little guy needs to be just as strong as the big guy. And, and that way we can have, we can have, I think, some peaceful uh, resolution to, to these issues that have become so important to us. And those are our, our freedoms, our liberties, and and subscribing to the ideals that have allowed that have allowed all of us here in the United States the opportunities that we've enjoyed to be successful and happy, and that everybody throughout the world should be able to to have. And, uh, and I'm thrilled to have you guys here. It's wonderful to see you. Hello to everybody in Germany. How beautiful! I'll see you when I come to visit. Things.